Hello, this is part 16 of our game making tutorial. Um, last time we were doing screen shake and um, if it didn't work for you, <laughs> a lot of these episodes have or will start with um, and if last episode didn't work for you, here's what, what it might have been. Um, so some people were in the comments on that were having trouble with it and they had some proposed solutions to it that I, I don't totally understand. Um, but the thing that did occur to me that I do understand is um, you won't get any screen shake if your view is uh, the same size or smaller than your, sorry, bigger than your room. Because screen shake is when, let's imagine this rectangle here is our view. Um, screen shake moves the view around the room. So when you have a big screen shake, it goes brrrr. And you have a small screen shake, it goes brrrr. <laughs> um, and if we made this room like 500 by 500, then, uh, well, this is a bad example because in this view I can move this around, but the way Game Maker works is you can't place the view outside the room. I don't think so. I don't think that's a way to actually get the view to move outside the room. So if you had it, I don't know how to make it exactly the same size, but if it was exactly the same size, no amount of screen shape would make it move at all because it can't go outside the borders. Um, so we can, I mean, I was assuming you'd have a room bigger than your view, like mine is. Um, I think I told you to just enter whatever you liked there, which was, <laughs> which I now regret. Um, but uh, even once you've done that, there's also the possibility of like, if the view is in the top left corner and the screen shake happens to want to shake it in up into the left, then it can't move. Like there's no way for it to go. Um, so we can solve this anyway. Um, to some extent. I, we're not going to try and make it absolutely perfect so that the screen shake is always exactly what the random value shows in every direction and in every position because you will barely notice the um, possible uh, edge cases and things that we're not accounting for. Um, and it's, for fuck's sake, a screen shake. It's random. <laughs> it's unpredictable. Um, and so our objective is just to get it looking good enough. And what we should do, our screen shake event is on the game object. Can I open up that code? It's already open. Um, and here, so all we're doing at the moment is just add on to the, um, uh, from our kind of origin position, which is our X and Y, that's the where the view would normally be in this current situation, we add on a random amount. Um, but now we want to do some other things with that random amount. So instead of adding on directly, we're going to cut that and say, um, shake X equals random range, yada, yada. Um, and we'll do the same for shake Y. because this is a random thing, and so we want to actually find out what, what is that going to be and store that value so that we can account for it in various ways. So that now, whatever in there does what, exactly what the previous code did, um, but it enables us to put some stuff between there. And let's first think about the problem, like if the view is the same size as the room, then um, there's really, that's almost unsolvable in the, in the traditional sense of like what we were trying to do because you can't move the view outside the room and if it's the same size, what are you going to do? <laughs> what do you even want to happen? You know, there is no space outside the room. If you want there to be space outside the room, then you make the room bigger. <laughs> that's what a room is. Um, but what we can do is just change the zoom level of the camera. So this, I think we've talked about um, in addition to like having the X view and the Y view, you have the W view and the H view and that's the width and the height of the view. And I think we've referenced that before because we um, actually even in in our initialize room code I think we set it. So we're going to set it again here, um, but we're going to set it to. Um, we have to first remember what we set it to in the first place because remember all of this stuff when you shake the screen temporarily, that's all well and good, but you need to know what it was before you shook it because at the end of it you want to bring it back to that. <laughs> if we just add something onto it or subtract from it without knowing what the original value was, then we can get lost. You know, we might not know what it ever was before, because these are random values and we're not remembering them permanently. So we can, you know, subtract them and undo our changes. Uh, initialize run, that's the thing that sets up all the um, screen heights and width. And we actually store it in a variable called screen width. Um, but the problem is this is this happens on our room startup code, do you remember that? It's not actually running on an object, it's when the room starts, the room itself runs this code. And so when it establishes a variable called screen width, that is a variable that doesn't exist outside of it anywhere else. Like you, a room is not like an object, you can't just access its properties. If you don't think you can. <laughs> I've never tried, but I assume you can't. Um, so we're going to make screen with a global variable. And to do that, you just put global in front of it. So 
if this was like a property of the player with like a player dot screen width, if you write the word global, you see it goes a different color. It goes kind of goldy instead of um, pink. Um, it's like an object that always exists. You, you know, you reference it exactly the way you'd reference a normal object. Um, and in fact, let's do. Can we do a search and replace on this? Um, I'm going to search and replace screen width with global dot screen width. And that worked. And then do the same for screen height. What I did there was I cut instead of copied. <laughs> so I'm going to paste that back in a sec. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Big sweeping search and replaces are always a good idea. Never go wrong. Um, the, these minus values are just my thing because I have to run in a window and I want the window to be smaller than the view. Um, I think that's all of them. Yeah, so now that won't change how this code works, but now we can reference this global screen width and that is our value for what we want. In fact, did we even say that? Hopefully we say it. Yeah, right here we say view uh, w view equals global screen width. That is us establishing what the normal width and height of the screen is. So that will be our baseline, and then we want to um, we want it to be smaller by however much we want to shake by. And remember, this could be positive or negative. It goes from minus shake amount to positive shake amount. So let's do abs shake x, um, and then we'll do something very similar for y. Instead of w view, it's h view because we want the height, and instead of screen width, it's screen height, and instead of shake x, it's shake y. Or shake you if you like that. <laughs> um, so that that will probably work fine. Um, but let's also just to add a bit of um, uh, impact to it. Uh, one thing we didn't do last time is you can also rotate the view, and that's just called view angle. I hope yes. Um, and we know what the normal of that is. It's zero. Zero is just the default angle for anything. So. Um, we can add on to that, and uh, we don't need to like add on to its current value. We just add on to zero, and so you don't need to even write that out. Um, should we do shake x? Yes. Um, so we're kind of saying like that: zero is the normal value. We're adding on shake x. Um, shake x is going to be like you know. I think we did some values of like 75 or 50 for sh screen shake. And so 50 degrees is a hell of a tilt. <laughs> we don't really want 50 degrees. We want the screen to rock by you know, 45 degrees as that. So the screen would be going um, And this is in one frame. And next frame it's going to tilt in a different direction, perhaps. Um, so shake x would be too much. Let's just divide it by 10. So there's no reason for it to be shake x rather than shake y. There's no reason for it to be divided by 10 rather than 15. This is just all guesswork and just kind of like whatever our value is. If it's a big shake, we want to tilt by a lot. And if it's a small shake, we want to shake by not much. Um, so, I think that's everything. Let's see how well that works. And then if this all works okay, we can move on to um, saving and loading. So there should be some kick when I fire this weapon. And there is! Ooh. And when I blow people up. Hard to notice because we're also getting kick from the gun itself. Um, and now let's make a good load of... Yeah, that's great! Um, Oh, and I guess I should try what happens if I set uh, let's do 1000 by 500 I'm just going to test what happens if my room is exactly the same size as my screen and do, do we still get some shake because it would be good if we did I think there are still some cases where our view We'll be in a position where it's not going to rock correctly. <laughs> but look, there's screen shake. Perfect. Um, oh, now I can't quit because the quit button's off the edge of the screen. But it's windowed mode, so we don't care. Uh, okay, let's put that back to where it was because that was a stupid value. Uh, that, and then the room height was that thing we changed. I'm actually going to change that to a thousand. Um, okay, that's screen shake done. Uh, the thing I wanted to talk about today was saving and loading, and there are two ways to do this. Um, one of which is the story of saving and loading in GameMaker is that it has functions built in for it, 
and you just literally write, um, I can write something like game save, and then I can just put like file name in the brackets, and that will actually create a file called, called file name um, in some folder, or who knows where. Um, and if we type game load file name, we will load that save game. Great, All right? Temptingly great, like almost too good to be true. Um, and since for as long as I've been using Game Maker, uh, Yo-Yo games, people who make Game Maker, have always said don't use our save function. Like for testing, whatever, like for experimenting, but don't put it in like a shipping game because it doesn't work well enough. You know, it's going to crash at any time. Um, it's not fully supported. It's just like it's there for your reference. And without making Gunpoint, which I made in Game Maker 8, which is a previous version to Game Maker Studio, um, I used it all the time, and it's so fast, and it's so, I, you know, I don't write a line of code, or I, I write one line of code, <laughs> I write game save, and it does everything for you, you know, it's saving thousands of instances and their positions and their statuses, and then load it, it just works perfectly. Um, and the files are like a couple of hundred kilobytes, um, the time to actually create the file is completely unnoticeable, you would only notice it if you if you um, like saved every single frame, like 60 times a second, that would slow it down. But um, to save every five seconds or 10 seconds as I did in Gunpoint um, is absolutely not, not at all noticeable. It doesn't matter if you create a bunch of files that don't get deleted properly, as I think I probably did in Gunpoint. Um, and it never went wrong. I made the game for three years, I never had a save game failure, um, except for if you, the only time, the only thing it didn't work for was if you patched the game then previous saves would become incompatible. Um, so I had to create two save systems. One was the in-game one where it'd save as much as you like, um, or save every five seconds and reload uh, any of the previous save games that you like. Um, but also if you quit the game, uh, I wouldn't know whether next time you played I might have patched it. I didn't want you to lose your progress or set up some kind of way of storing your progress through the game. So those are the two kinds of saving I'm going to talk about. The reason I tell the story about the save game system and Yo-Yo games constantly warning you it doesn't work is in Game Maker Studio it really doesn't work. <laughs> it works for this session, and then if you quit the game and start it up again, all your save games become invalid. So it's kind of the same problem I had with Gunpoint, which was it, like if you stopped playing, I couldn't guarantee you the saves would work when you came back because I might have patched the game, and I didn't want to have a situation where patching the game would, would destroy everyone's progress. Um, and in Game Maker Studio, you really have to worry about that because even if you don't patch the game, they're going to lose all their saves when they quit. So this, this works, but it's not good enough. Um, it is good enough if you want like, um, just sort of a quick restart thing, um, something like when you, I mean you could use this to go back five seconds. Um, uh, you can basically do most of what I did with Gunpoint with this. Uh, it's just that every time you quit, you would not be able to resume that level from where you were. So I think the important thing about this stuff is just to make sure that, um, uh, the player knows what they're, what's being saved and what isn't. So, when you're making your own games, don't don't give the player the impression that they're going to be able to save anywhere and never lose that progress, um, unless you can actually back that up. So, should we? Let's just do a very quick implementation of this. So, literally to test this, we're just going to do um, if keyboard check pressed um, board S and no, S has been used to it in our current controls, isn't it? Um, let's let's actually uh, not even use that. Let's do like BK down. That's the cursor key for down. I'm pretty sure. Um, so when you press down, it'll save the file to disk, and when you press up, it'll load it. I hope that's the right instruction. I don't think I've ever used these. Oh yeah, I have used these. You can use cursor keys in the endpoint. So um, hopefully this is correct. And that will be our save system, I think. I think that'll just work. But like I say, if you quit the game and come back, you'll, those saves won't work. It's something to do with instances and objects, and the instance not having the same ID or something. Um, so let's pick this up. Let's make a whole load of stuff and save our game. And then let's try again, totally consideration. And now let's load. Go back there. And load again. Go back there. And load again. Go back there. And so for like in-game effects, I mean, you look look how incredibly fast and perfect that loading is. Um, you could use this for like, I mean, maybe this isn't recommended, but <laughs> you could use this for special effects. You could have things, you know, go back and forth between two different states, um, and you could certainly make make a really cool game about like endlessly reliving the same few minutes, or a game where 
the instant you die, you just set back for a couple of seconds. I mean, I guess that's Gunpoint, but Gunpoint was a game where you, if you do a level properly, you never die. Um, like, once you know how to do it, there's no reason you would accidentally die. Uh, but you can make, like, a really highly skill-based game where every single false move you make kills you, but then you just go back straight to just before you did it, so you're just about, like, really fine-tuning that one thing. But you'll lose the saves when you quit. So make sure the player knows that. So that is... That's nice for, you know, completing one level, but um, a lot of you have asked um, uh, for guidance on how to make, like, how to give a player some persistent data that's saved you know, between levels and uh, between sessions. So we can do that, but it's a little bit trickier, and I'll say right up front, we are never going to make a save system where all of the data about everything you, that's in the level right now at this particular status is saved to disk and then it's loaded again when you um, start up again. It's possible, it's, there's no theoretical reason you can't do that. It just involves a lot of... You'll see once we've done it why that would be difficult <laughs> or just arduous. Um, there may be more efficient ways of saving data to disk than we're going to use, but um, I don't know. So what are you looking at me for? <laughs> so we're going to create a script that um, for now... Let's actually... Uh, we're going to replace that system. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to keep this or not. Um, for our purposes, I want to be able to test this new system, and I can't be bothered to think of two new keys to press, so I'm just going to delete this, and we're going to... Um, let's actually take that out. Um, we're going to run our save script on the player, because it's the player's data we want to save. Basically, the script we're going to do is going to save the player's inventory, whatever you've picked up, your weapons, um, and then we'll restore it. And the way we'll use this eventually is... Um, will save at a regular interval and when you um, start the game up again it will automatically load your inventory um, and one thing we won't do here that you should do you know in a full game is remember what level the player was on so we could have like you could just set up a, an array that's like level zero or maybe level completed zero equals true uh, when you finish the first level and then when you save the data, that will be one of the things you'd save and one of the things you'd load. Where it works with gunpoint is there's a... For some reason there's a different variable for every level in the game, um, instead of an array. And you st always start on the mission screen, and then when you, uh, when you load up the game, it reads in all the data, looks at what levels you've completed, and if you've completed a level, then it doesn't show the box to start that mission. And if you haven't completed a level and it's available to you, then it does show that. Um, we're not going to do that because we just want to keep it as simple as possible. It's quite a complicated thing, so I'm going to keep it just to saving our weapons and loading them. And this will be unbalanced, because it will mean you can pick up some weapons, um, quit, and then start the game again, and then you'll have the weapons already, and also there'll be weapons in the level. Um, but that's just because we're tasting it in a very limited fashion. So, in the player step event, we're going to have this, but instead of this game save thing, we're going to write our own thing. I'm going to call it save player... Let's just say, say player data right now. Um, and when we say up, we we'll say load player data, and these are functions we're going to write. So it doesn't matter that they don't exist just yet. Let's start with save player data. So the first thing we do is um, instead of just being able to type game save, we're going to have to create our own file, and then in that file we're going to write a bunch of data that we care about, and then we're going to write a corresponding load function that will open that file and read in the data. So the the command for that is um, we need a file name and then we also need to we're going to write something like um, uh, things like file text write is that going to happen? Okay, I guess. Uh, file text write string inventory and then we'll save some stuff but the problem with this is that uh, we need to specify what file we want to write that to and rather than typing out the file name each time, you create a reference for it. So we will write something like um, uh, save file. Just close that. Um, so that says we're going to write to the save file this word inventory. And so first we need to set that up. And so that's a variable like any other. It's kind of like um, when you're going to start writing to a file, you want to set up this, this reference point, this um, just a variable that stores that particular file um, so you can refer to it later. So we're going to say file text open 
open, we're going to write the file. Saving is writing files and loading is reading files. So we're going to do that and then we'll just have to put a file name here. So we'll just say player data. Um, you could do like dot sav. You can, this is a dirty secret of file formats is that like the extension doesn't really mean anything. You can put whatever you like there. The extension for the gunpoint save files are dot gun, but you can open them in a text editor and they're just plain text. In fact, you could just save them as text. And that's, some, in some ways that's quite nice because it tells the player if they ever go snooping around in their game folder, you know, they want to tinker with the game. And if you name it a text file, they know, oh, I can just open that text file and then uh, in a text editor. And then they can um, tinker with it if you want to let them. Um, personally, I'm all for that, I think. Like, if you want to fuck with the game's files, go ahead. The only thing I do is in Gunpoint, in the scripts folder, there's a little file that just says its file name is uh, warning there are spoilers in these files because if you open those, intending to like mod the game or something and then you read the dialogue you would spoil the game for yourself. Um, so yeah I think file playerdata.txt is, is a perfectly good file name for us and then once we set up like that actually creates the file and then from now on when we want to write to that file we use the word save file. And so the first thing we will write just the word inventory. Uh, that's just to make it more readable if it ever does get opened. Um, that's not really, you don't have to worry about the player opening this really. Um, but it's good for you <laughs> because in Gunpoint, a Gunpoint save file is just like <laughs> that's what it looks like. And when I look, we're in like debugging or testing file save systems and messing around with that stuff, it's a fucking nightmare that it's just a load of numbers and it doesn't tell, tell you what any of them mean. Um, just for a second, I'm just going to check this is recording. Yes, it would have been a particularly bad one to not realize it was you know, it failed to record for some reason. Okay, so. We open the file here. Let's comment this. Create the save file. Write a line of text to it. And then after you write something to the save file, the next thing you need to do is write lu, which is short for write line. And that actually just means um, write the end of the line. So if uh, if I was the computer following these instructions, I would open a file um, and I'd write the word inventory, that's what the first line says, and then the second line says press enter basically, it says that. Um, if you don't do that second line, then if we did like this twice in a row, that doesn't create the word inventory twice in a row, it creates it on the same line. It will just keep writing to the same line until you don't want to. So every time you want to press, every time you want to start a new line, you have to do this right line thing. So we'll do that, and then what we want to record is the player has this weapon array, and he has like weapon zero, he might have weapon one, I don't think there's any way to have weapon two at the moment, because <laughs> there are only two. Um, and we want to we want to write all that, but we don't know whether he has any, he might have none. Or he might have one, or he might have two, and if we add more weapons he might have, you know, 16 different ones. And we don't know how much data we're going to have to write, we don't know um, what that is yet. But we do want to go through all of his weapons and write each one to the file. Um, and we're going to do that in a special way, which I'll explain when we get to it. But first of all, we need a loop. So we're going to do um, create a variable to be like the index as we go through the inventory. And I'll say while i is less than uh, weapon count, then we'll record that we have this weapon. And then we'll do i plus plus. Or i equals i plus 1 is the more explicit way of writing that. Um, and for each one of these, we want to we want to write something, but instead of writing like a word of text, we want to. The thing we want to record about the weapons we have is not. Uh, we want to be able to recreate them, and to recreate a weapon, we just need to know what object it is, what type of weapon it is, and uh, that is called the object index. So. Instead of writing a string, we're going to write, if you want to write a number, it's file text write real. Real is short for real numbers, and real numbers are any numbers that aren't imaginary. <laughs> and if you don't know what imaginary numbers are, that sounds weird. Um, but it's numbers, just normal numbers. <laughs> That's all it means. Um, and those are the only two options for writing text files. You can either write a bit of text, or you can write a number. And the reason numbers are treated differently um, I think right now it doesn't matter if we write it as a string or as a real number, um, but uh, when you come to read them in, there'll be a big difference between the word to and the number to conceptually. So we want to write to that file, 
but we don't want to write the word inventory, we want to write um, one of the weapons in the weapon array, and it's going to be weapon number i. So if we have one weapon, then i equals zero, and then we test is, is i less than our weapon count? If we have one weapon, then our weapon count is one. i is less than one. So we go ahead, we get to here, and then we write down um, to our save file uh, weapon zero. We don't want the weapon itself, because the problem with weapon i, if I just write that, it's probably going to record the instance ID, and the instance ID is, it's not just single shot gun, it's this particular single shot gun, this one that was created on this session, and that ID will be totally different next session, and uh, when we try and load it, we're able to make sense of what that is. So instance IDs are very fickle, they'll be um, different every time you play, and you can't rely on them. So we want to record the object, what type of weapon was this, and that is, as I said before, object index. So when you're debugging, um, if you ever see like crash log, it will sort of say like, oh I couldn't find this, and it will be like um, uh, 1005, or sometimes just 5, and if it's like a really long number with loads of zeros in it, it's usually an instance ID, um, and Oh, what object IDs look like. I think they're just short numbers like 4 or 1 or 6 um, and it's those that we want to save. Yeah, in fact I'm pretty sure they are. So, after we save each weapon that we might have we want to write another line so that they're all on one line um, one line each because if we wrote them all one after the other they'd be in one massive string and then um, the problem with that is when we come to read it in we don't know where one number stops and when the next one starts so we're going to put a new line between each one and we'll do i equals i plus 1. Um, I keep forgetting to put the word save file. And you always have to specify what file you're writing a new line to. So, that will store all of our weapon data. And then the last thing, you know we said file text open here? Right at the end, after you finish writing to a file, you have to close it. Um, close save file. And I think that's kind of an operating system. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think that's kind of an operating system thing, where uh, while you're writing to a file, you kind of lock it off so no other system can access it, and you know, if, if someone in Explorer tried to move that file right now, Explorer would know, hey, don't move that file because we're writing to it right now. Um, and if you don't close it, it'll be locked like that forever, and it will cause problems for you as well when you come to try and write to it, for example. Uh, sorry, read from it. Like, you can't do both at once. So every time you finish doing it, you need to uh, close it. So, is that all correct? That's kind of like an intro. This is actually storing weapons. Let's give it a heading. Um, there's a list of our weapons. That should all be okay. So we can actually... Um, we signed a key, didn't we? It's just going to be the down key. Hopefully it will register that that's a real function now. We'll comment this one out because we haven't written it yet. And let's just see if we can test this one. So obviously we won't be able to load the data, so we won't know what's happening. But if I just save some data and then I look it up afterwards, um, I can just find it on my computer. Um, so let's pick up both weapons, and then I press the down key, and then I'm just going to quit the game. And now here in my search window, hopefully, oh yeah, is it named it? PlayerData.txt. Look, it says inventory eight and nine. So those are the object indexes of the single shot gun and the wave gun. Um, so that's the file that's created. Um, if you look up in the he heading up here, it's been put in users slash pentadact slash app data slash local slash make a game with no experience slash player data. The most logical folder where anyone would look for their C games. Obviously everyone knows to look there. Um, that is the downside of um, Game Maker Studio, the way it does it. Is it kind of conforms to how Windows wants you to do it or how certain... <laughs> when you're talking about Microsoft, you have to specify certain factions within Microsoft want you to write it there. Other factions want you to write it in totally different places, and other editions of Windows have totally different standards where that should be. Um, and in previous versions of Game Maker, you could just write a file directly to the folder the, where the player had installed the game, which I prefer, uh, but now it gets put in fucking users, which, or app data local, which is... Uh, who the hell knows where that is. Um, if you're going to make a game uh, that you release on Steam, then great, because you can just use Steam Cloud to synchronize those things and the user doesn't really need to know where they are because th that will be um, how they share them across multiple computers. If you're not going to do that, I would recommend um, 
Uh, I can probably open that folder, can't I? So this is how you find the folder. Actually, no, we're not getting into this. So there's a way to create a shortcut uh, to that folder, but you have to use a special magic word that will be interpreted differently by different operating systems. And um, I would recommend putting a shortcut in the user's folder so that if they ever go snooping in their folder for, hey, where are my save games? They won't find save games. We can't put the save games there, but we can put a little shortcut that says, hey, here's where your save games are. And you double click it and then it takes you to the folder. Um, that's easier than ever trying to tell someone, oh, it'll be in your users slash then your username then app data then local. Oh, unless you're on a Windows 8, which means it's a different folder. Or if you're on Windows XP, it's a different folder. Um, so yeah, we, that, there's a way to do that. Um, I'm not going to cover it here because it's too much work. <laughs> so, we've successfully written a file. That's great. And now, we want to load that file when we press up. And loading is pretty similar. It's This time we um, want to read that file. So it's the same file name, and we're going to store it as the same... We could say load file there, but to be honest, it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to keep calling it the save file. And then... Now, we're the first thing we're going to encounter when we open that file for reading is a line we don't care about, the word inventory. We don't need to read that in, it doesn't tell us anything. Um, so, we actually just want to skip it. Um, so, we're not going to do anything with that, we're just going to read in this right line means put a new line, not press enter. Read line means skip the rest of this line and move on to the next one. So, we know the word inventory is going to be on this line, we're going to skip it and move on to the next one. And now, um, here, we don't want, we can't do while i is less than weapon count, because we don't know what our weapon count was when we saved this file. Uh, we could have stored it, but it's easier just to, for this simple case, we're just going to say, what we wanted to do is go through here and, and um, keep reading in weapons until it reaches the end of the file. And there's a word for that, file text uf. <laughs> save file. Um, so that says it's the end of the file. So we want to say while that is false, while we haven't reached the end of the file. I'll write that. While we haven't reached the end of the file. Um, if we were going to save more data than this, we're going to go on to like save which levels you completed and other data, then we couldn't rely on this because we wouldn't, wouldn't want it to read in every other piece of data in the whole file. We would uh, probably want to do something like actually store how many weapons you had before you list all the weapons, and then we'd read that in and use that as a counter for this loop. Um, stuff like that, I mean, save systems are infinitely complex. There's no limit to how complicated you can make them. <laughs> There's no limit to the ambition of what you might want to do with them. Um, and so I'm not going to try and teach you how to do everything you could possibly do with them. I'm not going to show you how to do gunpoint save system, which was like five um, saves in separate about like five seconds. That was really hard. It took a very long time to figure out how to do that. And it's not simple. <laughs> I can't summarize it for you in less than like an hour. Um, and uh, it's not worth me going through like, you know, all the possible applications you could want to do with this. Um, basically, the purpose of the series is to introduce you to the concepts and the the nitty gritty details, the kind of the syntax that you have to learn, you just have to know how to do this. Uh, that stuff is very arduous and difficult to find out for yourself by just reading help files. Um, once you find the help files, it's, it, they're all very good, but it's hard to know where to start, right? You know, I want to save games, how, what's the best way to do that? Or the help won't tell you that, it will just tell you nine different ways of doing it, and it won't say which ones are, are better. Um, so this is how I did it in Gunpoint. Um, but I'm only going to teach you the basic principles and then the... Basically, the stuff I'm leaving to you, I think of as just logic. <laughs> like, the things I'm not going to tell you how to do is how to use the tools I've, I've given you to create a particular system or a particular way of setting something up. Um, you uh, will hopefully get to the point where you can figure that stuff out for yourself. It might be difficult, it might take a long time. You might want to make a much simpler version first and mess around with that and get confident. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the... the um, purpose of this tutorial is just to introduce the actual um, syntax and particular uh, details that you need to know in order to then go on and learn and figure out more logic on your own. So this is going to be called load player data. We open the file for reading, we skip the first line, <coughs> we start a loop, and until we reach the end of the file, we keep reading in weapons. And we haven't done that yet, so this is, this is the bit we haven't done. Um, 
we can just change this to read real. So here, now look, we've written, if we look at our text file here, it's just eight. This is a text file. Everything in a text file is text until you, <laughs> until you know otherwise. So reading, saying file text read real instead of read string means um, read what's on this line and interpret it as a number. If we wrote letters there, I guess they'd probably come out to zero or something, I don't know. Um, but it will always, will always get a number out of this. So um, obviously we, we don't specify what information we want in that bracket. Um, so we just look at the file and we read in whatever's on this line. And that is the function that will return a value. So we need to save it somewhere. So we could say, um, let's actually write this out because it will make our code easier to read. Weapon type equals that. Um, this variable will be reused and overwritten each time we go through this loop. And then we actually want to create one. So we're just going to say instance create xy weapon type. So for all of the um, weapon types that we stored in that file, we're going to go through them and create one. And we're creating it, this is all running on the player, so x and y means the player's x and y. And our weapon system is such that when we drop a weapon at our feet, we automatically pick it up and it gets added to our inventory. So all that code for putting something in your inventory, we've already written that, and it already will handle this for us, so we don't need to be able to write it again. So um, that read in the line, then we created the weapon, then we don't want to write a line, we want to read a line. Again, that means skip the rest of this line. Um, even if we're right at the end of the line, if we've already got all the data from it, you still need to say that to say move on to the next line. And then i equals i plus 1, and then closing the file will be exactly the same. So I think that's everything. I think that should work. Let's just check. Read, read, end of file, read, read. I think that all makes sense. So let's just re-enable it here. Load their data. Recognizes the function now. And this will, will now have a horrible mess of a game where you can just exploit it like by picking up weapons and then um, loading your save game and um, uh, endlessly accumulating. So what do I want to do? I'm going to pick them up, then I'm going to save, I'll press down, down key, then I'm going to start a new game, then I'm going to press up, and I got my weapons! And that's both of them! Oops, sorry, I clicked outside the window. <laughs> that wasn't a game problem, I just misclicked. Um, yeah, I got both weapons. And now, like I say, you can exploit it, because now I can pick up these two weapons, and now I've got two versions of each one. Um, which is not intended, but the way you'd use this normally is, um, in a proper game, is you'd have multiple levels, and you would store also which levels a player has and hasn't done, and you probably have some kind of hub from which you select the levels or go to them, like a main menu screen, perhaps, <laughs> which I've been disparaging about in the past. Um, and then you would just ensure that the player can only go to rooms that he hasn't already completed, um, and you would probably want to only save this data when you um, finish a room, for example. So, okay, that goes spazzing out. I know why that is, um, and I can fix that. Um, so, basically, the reason it's exploitable now is because like, it's up to me when I want to save. When you make a proper game, you will want to specify strictly when the data is saved, and I think at the end of a level when you repeat it, that's a good time to do it. That's how I do it at gunpoint. When you finish a level, I save all the data about your inventory and, and your status and stuff, and I mark that mission as completed, and that's also saved in the file, so that when you load it up again, you can't farm that level of resources by going back to it, because it's already marked as completed. Um, and you anything you gained in that level, you kept, but you can't go back and get it again, and that kind of stuff. So that's all, I mean, that's... <laughs> hesitate to say basic, but it's all logical. It's all stuff that you can figure out for yourself. Um, and hopefully that's enough. Just before I go, I am going to fix that because that's crazy, the um, enemy gibbering around here. That's not a problem with the collision system, it's that I edited this sprite last time and I forgot to center the origin. So that origin is right at the edge and that means as he rotates he's massively changing his collision box. Um, and we should find that doesn't happen when I load it again. I could also try and right now this is like the system we made is not for in level loading because there's a problem with it uh, which is that if I save now I have no weapons I pick up these weapons and then I press load nothing changes I've still got the weapons because we don't take anything away from player right now we just give him what he had and um, that's okay because we wouldn't be loading in the middle of a mission this is the between level players overall progress the kind of permanent stuff um, and 
at the start of each level we would load that in and give him the weapons that he has and then at the end of the level we would lose them all, um, well, like lose them all technically, uh, so that when we start the next level they're read in from a file rather than trusting what he bought from the last level. So they do get a bit complicated, sorry about that, there's no sh I don't think there's any easy way around that. If you want persistent data you're going to have to be very specific about what you want to save, when you want to save it and when you want to load it in and that isn't stuff that I can necessarily give you like one particular way of doing it and you'll always do it this way, it's going to be stuff you have to figure out for yourself. Um, so I think that's it for this episode, thanks.